Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Sustainable architecture is also referred as green architecture or environmental architecture. It challenges architects to produce smart designs and use available technologies to ensure these structures generate minimal harmful effects to the ecosystem and the communities. And with a world in the midst of climate change emergency, it has a big role to play. However, it no doubt has its challenges such as costs and accessibility. To find out more about this topic, I'm in conversation today with Nanochka Tchaikovsky, an architect who has more than 25 years' experience leading major architectural projects and developing innovation and research opportunities working with architects, academics and industry partners. She is co-CEO of BVN Architecture, where she steers the firm's research into robotics and digital fabrication. She wants to realise smarter and more creative solutions that are better for the planet, especially by using robotics, advanced technologies and new materials. She's passionate about the role architects play in shaping our interactions, communities and cities and applies a whole systems thinker approach to the brief using unique angles resulting in award-winning design. Quite interestingly, Nolochka is also co-leading the design of one of Sydney's most famed projects of its time, Atlassian's future headquarters at Central Station. This low-carbon project will be the tallest hybrid timber building in the world of 40 storeys. She's a commissioner on the Commission of the Future of Sydney CBD, which is tasked with examining changing nature of city in a post-COVID-19 world. So I warmly welcome you to the podcast, The Politics of Everything. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for having me. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content, and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech-savvy. There's nothing to download, they just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automatic post-production all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to zen.ai forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z. E N dot A I politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. Okay, did you always want to be an architect or when you were a kid, what did you think you'd do for a living? No, I didn't always want to be an architect. I thought I'd be a vet, actually. <laughs> um, and then I think as I got a little bit older in my school years, I realized that there was uh, something about the creative process that I really loved. And I went off and explored graphic design and then realised there wasn't maybe enough of a challenge in that from my perspective and so I settled on architecture. So then you went and studied architecture after doing some design work or how long was the study process before you got your first job? Uh, so six year, architecture, six years, and I basically went straight into architecture from school. And then we have the fourth year out, actually, of university where um, we're supposed to be doing practical things. But it was a year of recession at that time. And so I think I just ended up working in a whole lot of bars and very cool restaurants in London. At the most. Observing some great design while, uh, yeah, serving alcohol, perhaps. Exactly. I was exploring hospitality design at that point in time. But um, yeah, so six years of study and, and then I uh, got my first job sort of straight after university. So decarbonisation is a big deal at the moment. Explain to us in sort of a quite truncated way how much waste we kind of maybe don't see for people that are not part of the building process and I guess how that contributes to climate change. At the end of the day, most of us just see a finished building. We don't necessarily see all that goes into it. Yeah. So, well, maybe there's a couple of ways to think about it. So uh, the construction industry contributes about 40% to about 40% of the planet 
estimates overall carbon emissions, which is really quite significant. So that's almost half, which tells you that we must be doing something wrong. And in terms of waste, I suppose when we when we kind of analyse what that 40% is made out of, a big part of it is actually materials. And so about 30% of the carbon emissions the construction industry overall creates is related to materials there are other things in there obviously operational carbon which is the cost of the cost of the planet of running the buildings so they're really the two they're really the two big ones it's operating emissions and it's embodied carbon uh, which sits within all of the components that make up a project so that can be the concrete the steel timber plasterboard skirting boards furniture, all of those elements. So, for example, steel is obviously massively expensive, particularly at the moment um, with what's happening in the building industry and inflationary pressures and so forth. It's also often the clunky part of buildings, you know, created sort of, I guess, for that construction brain versus our design brain. And when we kind of think about beautiful buildings, we don't necessarily want to see chunks of steel in them. Explaining to us a little bit about what that concern is around steel and I guess what are the innovations what's the solution to actually making perhaps this particular product a bit more sustainable and I guess does that cost more to do that but long term is better like what's the equation involved in that? Yeah so steel uh, steel contributes almost two tonnes of carbon dioxide for every tonne of steel that's produced. So it's quite significant. So seven, about 7% of greenhouse, you know, of total greenhouse gas emissions are actually a result of steel production. So one of the critical things that's happening globally at the moment is that we're um, trying to produce steel without fossil fuels using hydrogen. And and that for sure is the way of the future. It's happening in some pockets at the moment. It's not really available in Australia. So for example, for... Why? (laughs) Is there a reason? because we have a very um, fruitful coal industry. I think at the moment there probably, you know, there has been some attempts to get it up and hopefully it will happen. Uh, It needs to happen here. Uh, But at the moment we can't buy green steel here in Australia. So, for example, for the Atlassian project, which does have a combination of steel, concrete and timber as the primary sort of structural materials, we are buying the steel from a combination of Luxembourg and South Korea where they produce green steel so it's still even buying it from overseas and shipping it to Australia is better for the planet than us using not green steel. Mm, That's fascinating most people wouldn't even think there was a I guess a green option for steel so I think it's a fascinating rabbit hole to kind of go down. So for your practice how do you define sustainable architecture and I guess why does it matter? I mean, I think we, we're all very aware that we want to, you know, have a better footprint. We want to reduce our emissions. Um, a lot of, you know, buzz around greenwashing, seven-star energy ratings on buildings and products and so forth. But what's your kind of perspective on this? Okay, well, one, I mean, there's a couple of things, but and if you don't mind, just before I go to that one, just to yeah. circle back on the steel thing, you know, steel's not entirely evil and we will we will need steel there is no alternative for the in in certain structural situations for us to avoid totally and so that's why what we need to think about in terms of the way we build generally across projects is we need to look at all sorts of materials we we can't there will be no silver bullet in one actual material so even though we'll you know, we are using, say, more timber construction and mass timber construction. That's not going to solve the problem globally. So we, we're, there's some really good work happening in terms of concrete and reducing the carbon within concrete production. Um, and then if we can get green steel up, particularly here in Australia, but globally as being kind of the primary product. And then we've got other new materials like mass timber construction, which has been around for a long time in Europe and North America, not so much here in Australia, but it's got a lot of traction now here. And then there's other new materials like recycled plastics and things like that, which are also, or biomaterials, which are really interesting. So just from a materials perspective and how we make up projects, we've just got to continually be looking at the suite of different options. 
Yeah, I think that's a good perspective to have. I think that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so going back to the question, though, about why is why is sustainability important to us, I suppose the way we think about it now is, well, fundamentally, if we're architects and we operate on the planet and we're contributing to this 40% of global carbon emissions, we have to help solve that problem. Like it would be, you know, we, I mean we must be part of the solution. So, you know, our goal is to try and push forward on every project we do as well as it's it's baked into our vision and our strategy for our business. And the way we think about it is probably more around regenerative design. And when we say regenerative design, what we really are looking at is like a whole systems approach to how we create outcomes that are better for the planet and how they bring ecology, infrastructure and society together in a more positive and optimistic way that gives back to the planet rather than just depletes it. Yeah, that's a great summary. I think of I think most people would understand and appreciate that, but it, yeah, it must seem like a big task some days. It it certainly can be heady on some days, <laughs> and you know each project is slightly different. Uh, we have some projects like Atlassian, which have you know really strong sort of regenerative requirements baked into them. So you know that that are sort of exemplar projects and then we have others that are, you know, making small incremental changes. But we're always going to have those outliers and we want those outliers because they help bring everything else along. But certainly for our practice, it's um, it's it's absolutely front and centre. And, and the other part, and, and there's sort of three bits that make it up as well, which is one is how we reduce what we use when we make something. The other one is how we optimise what it is that we need. And the last part is how we produce energy on site. So there's a range of different things that we can do for every project in those three areas. But reduction is sort of the base of the pyramid, if you like, and then, and then we go optimise and produce so what role does, say, 3D printing play in the future of architecture? And I think about this because I had a guest on, I think about, about a year ago, that was looking at doing sort of sustainable building projects on a very lean budget in developing nations. It was one of his sort of, you know, pet projects because he'd been a very successful entrepreneur in a different life. And he was looking at 3D printing, for example. Is that something that, you know, is, is part of the practice or a little bit or not that important? I mean, I guess a lot of people understand what 3D printing is. So is that something that you look to? Absolutely. So we've been working with 3D printing, mainly using robotics, so using robotic arms, which is large scale 3D printing since about 2016. And because in our mind, if we're going to make, you know, if given the contribution construction's making to global carbon emissions, we need radical change and we need radical transformation in the way that we build. We can't just keep building with sort of sticks and sheets of things. And the, what 3D printing offers us is a way to really think very carefully and have program from design from the design file all the way to you know the production process exactly how much material we want to lay down and where we want to lay it down because 3d printing happens in layers as you know and we can really optimize how we the material that we use how much we need where we need it but we can also explore new kinds of materials so for example we've just we recently invented a new air diffusion system which replaces steel ductwork and it's got 90 percent less embodied carbon because it's made out of recycled plastic hospital waste and that's we're only able to to actually use that kind of material because we're we're 3d printing it robotically amazing that's incredible mm. it's just it's just it's just you wouldn't have even thought of that a generation ago really would we we would have dreamed of it in a sci-fi movie but not necessarily thought it'd be part of the everyday practice you are mentioning robotics quite a lot they obviously play a very important part in sustainable architecture give us an idea of the sorts of things that you are using robotics for beyond 3d printing perhaps that you know we we may not be aware of 
Yeah, for sure. Well, there's a couple of other things. I mean, we've also done, we've, we've used uh, robots to weave carbon fibre threads to make something, uh, to make structure. So again, looking at what's the smallest amount of material we can use and lay it down in a very accurate way to structurally support something. So that, that was a very interesting project. We also use virtual reality. So we're working in virtual reality to explore projects in very detailed ways before they're actually constructed and then and that way reducing the waste of of the project itself through the design process and we have also worked with augmented reality so looking at how we can use augmented reality to help with the site processes so for example you could have you know someone on site with an ipad who can look at you know a ceiling layout through either you know hold the ipad up and understand what the what it is that they need to construct before they start that process so all of those things help us reduce the amount of time, cost and resources that we're expending on projects, which is a huge factor in why construction is so expensive. You know, like it's not sustainable the way that we're building at the moment. We cannot, you know, it's not even, it's not even affordable. Yeah, exactly. And maybe that's the point at which people start really paying attention as well. If something's not as sustainable, but is affordable or cheaper, then that might satisfy but obviously you know we're looking at the long term here and it sounds like this is the future yeah absolutely and I think the the other really critical part of it is just looking you know very much we're very much focused on how can we prefabricate as much as we possibly can so how can we create modular structures how can we build in a way that we're building probably more off-site and then assembling on site and that process like the change of thinking in doing that on its own saves a lot of time and also saves a lot of waste we did a um a large project for the australian national university and two really big timber buildings there and in using a mass timber construction approach and also very big prefabricated facade system we reduced a site crew from about 60 people to about 10 oh and my goodness reduced the program time from to about uh, had about a 30 percent reduction on the program time so you know there's like once you build like that it's the sort of thing that you can't unsee you don't really want to go back to doing everything in the very traditional manner so we will focus a little bit now on the uh, the fabulous new Alassian building, which um, I think has been estimated to cost $1.4 billion. And um, even my overseas listeners will obviously have heard of Atlassian and, and you know, understand some of their environmental credentials and I guess their their founders focus on, on that sort of um, idea of leaving the planet in a better place than which it is right now. What are some of the elements that make that particular building so unique and I guess pushing that envelope a little bit on the sustainable design front yeah well yeah Alassian is a great example so at the moment it's what we would call the world's tallest hybrid timber tower now by the time it's completed it's likely that you know someone else might have pipped it at the post in that <laughs> but that depending would, how long it takes perhaps as well depending on how long it takes but that's actually a good thing because it means that you know there's more coming of a similar nature which is which is only which is really ultimately the goal so being the tallest hybrid timber tower that really means that it's made up you know traditionally a tall commercial tower would be made up of just concrete and steel mostly concrete in Australia this one has a concrete core a steel exoskeleton sort of outer structure and then every four floors is made up of timber construction so it's a it's a really combined structural system and through combining those different materials it reduces the embodied carbon and the goal is that we reduce the overall embodied carbon of the project by 50 percent compared to a similar a building on the similar site with a traditional uh, structural system and so that's one part of the project which is super interesting and very challenging the other part is that it's 40 stories Uh, it's designed 
primarily for Atlassian to be the, the, the main occupier, but it's also got a hotel in the first five floors, which is a very sort of cool budget hotel, a new offering for the YHA. And so the idea of having a sort of a, a mixed use development is is also very interesting and, and one to explore for lots of projects going forward. But every four floors in the in the tower of the building has a park and then it oh, also that's has, wild. It's yeah, just... it's amazing. So you can be on level 40 and you can have access to nature and you can also have natural ventilation. So there's three modes of ventilation that happens in that building. So it's not like a normal commercial building where um, the whole it's a sealed glass box. It's got an it, there's got some parts of it which we call outdoors, which just is full fresh air. Then we've got the mid doors, which is a combination of fresh air and um, some tempered air, so slightly treated air. And then we've got the full indoors, which is like a, a, a more traditional environment, but but done with less operational usage. So that's very important. We've also got on-site photovoltaics. So there's ledges on the facade as it goes up the building that hold photovoltaic solar cells and overall uh, it's sort of set to re- be, uh, it will be operated on 100% renewable energy with much lower operational energy targets. I wouldn't have expected anything less to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah so there's lots of really interesting parts of it and 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 every four levels is what we call a habitat and the idea about that is you know how do you have 4,000 people working vertically in a building and feeling like they belong you know so what's how does it socially connect people um, and how does it create these sort of mini neighborhoods up the building that that create smaller communities within the bigger community of the organization so it's working on a whole range of different levels so beyond that project what has your been your favorite project to date and why (laughs) It's really it's a really hard question to ask. It's like choosing a favourite child, it maybe is, I'm not sure. <laughs> the one that actually resonates with me, and I suppose I hold it deep in my heart, is it's a really small project, but it was one that we did for a community in Victoria called Narbathong, which if you remember the Black Saturday fires. Oh yes. Yeah, yes. so Narbathong was a very small community that sat between King Lake and Marysville, and they couldn't get traction with any of the authorities to help them rebuild the only community building they had, which was their community hall. It's quite a, a small community. And uh, we came on board through Emergency Architects and actually worked with them for a couple of years. It took that long to, to jump through all the crazy hoops of government and everything and we built them this really beautiful new community hall which was all timber on the inside because they were a timber town but it was fireproof on the outside and you know the governor general ended up coming and opening it and the community just were so grateful and embraced the building so much and it just become sort of the heart of their their community to help them rebuild and it was a very rewarding project. Oh, I can imagine. That sounds incredible and life-changing really for people in that community given what they had been through. Absolutely. And they were just, you know, they were incredibly grateful. We just did it pro bono. So, you know, it was, it was, we just had a very kind of lovely relationship and we also had to, it it was, it was one of those projects that, you know, every step of the way you weren't quite sure if it was going to happen. So the fact that, you know, it ultimately did was, was really lovely. Who's been your most important mentor in life or your career and why? Um, I've had, I don't think I've had one. I've, I've probably had maybe. Your number one maybe. <laughs> four, I would say. I think probably I would have to say Lawrence Neild. Lawrence was, so Bl- I, I am co-CEO of BVN, which used to be Bly Voller Neild. And Lawrence and I met when I was actually in my final year of university. He was my professor professor and uh, in that final year we also started co-editing um, some architectural journals together and he was incredibly supportive of me I went on to work with a couple of others and eventually circled back and kind of went and had a coffee with Lawrence and said can I come and join Blybel and Neild at the time and then he he said absolutely and you know brought me in to, to BBN and pretty quickly sort of you know, was constantly mentoring me through that process and then uh, to the point of where he'd say things like, you know, every good architect should carry their own drawings to a meeting. You you, you must carry the drawings. <laughs> <laughs> but he was incredibly supportive and then eventually we became business partners and he subsequently retired 
and uh, we're, we're still, you know, we're still close and, um, yeah, I really value everything that he did for me. If we spoke again in a year's time, what would be your number one goal to have achieved and why? Whew. Yeah, okay, so mine, <laughs> I've got It one. can be personal or professional here. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a playful question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, probably that I, you know, keep my son sort of on the rails <laughs> and manage to do all, help him with his homework consistently. <laughs> That'd be one. That'd be um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, but one of the things that I'm, I would really love to have achieved in the next year is that um, we have fully commercialised our 3D printed recycled plastic duct system and that's something we're working on at the moment and it's incredibly exciting. It's getting lots of interest Um, uh, but I I think it's one of those one of those things that um, it demonstrates how as architects we can create value even beyond, you know, what we're traditionally known for. And I think that's something I'd love to achieve for us and achieve for myself and also just show others the power of creativity. A final takeaway message for us on the politics of sustainable architecture. Start, just start now. Like there, you know, it's, I think everyone, everyone has to start somewhere. And I think the main thing is to start. The big Probably the big one for us is we're really focused on embodied carbon at the moment and that's, I think, going to be a game changer for how we build. Absolutely. So we're watching this space and seeing what what you do next, I'm sure. If you do want to connect further with my guest today or find out more about her firm, of course, there'll be some details on the show notes as always. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amber. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon. 